Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Dear students, welcome to this session on popliteal fossa. I am Dr. Ravichandran Swami, Professor of Anatomy, Karpagam Faculty of Medical Sciences and Research, Coimbatore. So, let us begin this uh, session with a small case scenario. A 23 year old student received a severe blow on the posterolateral side of the left knee joint while playing football. Radiograph of the left knee showed fracture of the head and neck of the fibula. The patient was not able to dorsiflex and evert the left foot. So, the clinical diagnosis of this condition is foot drop, which is due to injury to the common peroneal nerve, which is located in the popliteal fossa. So, the contents of popliteal fossa are very important. So, first of all, we will study the anatomy of the popliteal fossa. Now, I am going to talk to you in the following topics, a brief introduction, the boundaries of popliteal fossa, contents of popliteal fossa, description of contents and the clinical aspects involved in this region. Now, you can see this picture on your left side. This is the thigh, this is the knee joint here, this is the calf and the foot here. Now, the popliteal fossa by definition, it is a small diamond shaped depression situated behind the lower part of the femur, behind the knee joint and the upper part of the tibia. The fossa is very clearly seen in a flexed knee and it is homologous to the cubital fossa in the upper limb located in front of the elbow. Now, before going to the boundaries, let us have a small recap on the muscles of the posterior aspect of the lower limb. Now, if you see this picture here, the posterior aspect of the lower limb is divided into the gluteal region, the back of the thigh and the calf region. And behind the knee joint, you see the diamond shaped fossa that is the popliteal fossa. Now, if you see the back of the thigh, we have some important structures. The back of the thigh extends from the lower limit of the gluteal region to the back of the knee. The contents of this region include hamstring muscles, shorted of biceps femoris, sciatic nerve, posterior femoral cutaneous nerve, and an anastomotic chain of blood vessels. Now, you look at this picture here. This is the gluteal region. This muscle is called as the gluteus medius. This is the gluteus maximus. On the posterolateral aspect, you see the iliotibial tract, which is the thickened fascia into which the gluteus maximus muscle is attached. The hamstring muscles, which are located in the back of the thigh, they include four muscles. Number one, adductor magnus particularly the ischial part of the adductor magnus, then biceps femoris, the long head of the biceps femoris, semi-tendinosus and semi-membranosus. So, these are the four muscles which are included in the group of hamstring muscles. Now, let us see the muscles one by one. Here on the medial side, just below the gluteus maximus, you see a muscle, this is the adductor magnus. Then here you can see the semimembranosus muscle. This is the semimembranosus muscle on the medial side. Then here lower down you can see the semitendinosus muscle and on the lateral side you see the biceps femoris muscle. So this is the biceps femoris muscle. Now the hamstring muscles should fulfill some criteria 
to be called as hamstring muscles. So what are those criteria or features? Number one, all the muscles they have to take origin from the ischial tuberosity. The muscles should be inserted into one of the long bones of the leg and all the muscles should be supplied by tibial nerve. They should flex the knee joint and extend the hip joint. So these are the four features based on which we classify them as hamstring muscles. The biceps femoris has got two heads, the short head and long head, of which the long head alone is included in the hamstring group, whereas the short head is not included. That is because the short head is arising from the femur. Similarly, the adductor magnus, we have the ischial part which is coming from the ischial tuberosity and we have the pubic part. The pubic part is not included. So, the ischial part of the adductor magnus is included in the hamstring group. Now, look at this picture. So, you can see all the muscles which are arising from the ischial tuberosity and the, uh, they are inserted either into the tibia or into the fibula crossing the knee joint. Now, if you see the adductor magnus muscle, it is inserted in the adductor tubercle of the femur here, which is not crossing the knee joint, but still it is included in the hamstring group because the tibial collateral ligament, which is the degenerated, morphologically degenerated tendon of this muscle, crosses the knee joint and is inserted into the tibia. Now, so what, uh, what we have so far learnt is the different muscles here, the back of the thigh, the adductor magnus, the semimembranosus, the semitendinosus and the biceps femoris. Now let us see some of the muscles of the back of the leg. So why we are going through these muscles is, if you know the muscles here, these are the muscles which are going to form the boundaries of the popliteal fossa. So, if you know the muscles, particularly the hamstring muscles and the superficial muscles of the back of the leg, it is easy for us to understand the boundaries of the popliteal fossa. Now, here on the medial side, we have a muscle that is called as the medial head of gastronomius. On the lateral side, that is, we have another muscle that is called as the lateral head of the gastronomius. These two muscles, they join together and they form a tendon that is called as the tendocalcaneus. Then above here, very close to the knee joint, posteriorly, we have another muscle that is the plantaris. Then we have another superficial muscle that is called as the soleus. So of this, the main muscles that is the uh, semimembranosus, semitendinosus, biceps femoris, plantaris, and the medial and lateral heads of gastronomias, they are going to form the boundaries of the popliteal fossa because they are closely situated here. Now, just I would like to mention very briefly about the sciatic nerve because the sciatic nerve is getting divided into two nerves, the tibial nerve and common peroneal nerve and both of them are contents of the popliteal fossa. So, a brief mention about sciatic nerve, the root value of the sciatic nerve is L4, L5, S1, S2 and S3. It emerges from the lower border of the gluteus maximus muscle. It passes straight down deep to the biceps femoris muscle and at the superior angle of the popliteal fossa, it divides into its terminal divisions that is the tibial nerve and common peroneal nerve. Branches in the thigh, it gives rise to some motor branches to hamstring muscles mainly and it gives rise to the short head of biceps femoris. Now, we will discuss the boundaries of the popliteal fossa. We as of now, we know the different muscles in the back of thigh and the calf muscles. So, these are the muscles which are going to form the boundaries of the popliteal fossa. Now, look at this picture. This is the rhomboid shaped fossa that we have put here separately like a diamond shape. Here we have 
four borders four corners the superior medial border superior lateral border inferior medial border and inferior lateral border apart from that there are roof there is a roof and a floor so the boundaries of the popliteal fossa includes superior medial border superior lateral border inferior medial border inferior lateral border and a roof and a floor now we will just look into the four borders that is the superior medial superior lateral inferior medial and inferior lateral the superior medial is formed by the semi membranosus muscle and semi tendinosus muscle they these are the two muscles here this, that is this this is the semi membranosus and this is the semi tendinosus the superior lateral boundary is formed by only one muscle that is the biceps femoris the inferior lateral boundary is formed by the plantaris muscle and the lateral head of the gastrocnemius both of which are superficial muscles of the calf and on the inferior medial side we have the medial head of the gastrocnemius so these are the four boundaries that is superior medial superior lateral inferior lateral and inferior medial and these are the different muscles which form these borders now floor the floor is nothing but the most anterior structure that is very close to the uh, or very deep structure when you see in another plane it is lies actually more anterior and the structures forming the floor or the popliteal surface of the femur so this is the femur bone this is the tibia this is the fibula and this is the outline of the capsule of the knee joint so here we can see the popliteal surface of the femur which is forming the floor then the capsule of the knee joint also forms the floor we have another ligament that is called as the oblique popliteal ligament then we have the posterior aspect of the upper end of the tibia and this muscle is the popliteus muscle and we have a fascia covering this popliteus so these are the structures which are forming the floor namely popliteal surface of femur capsule of knee joint oblique popliteal ligament posterior aspect of upper end of tibia and the fascia covering the popliteus now if you see the uh, fossa from a lateral view here you can see the there is a fat pad which is covering the popliteal surface of the femur in this fat pad there will be few lymph nodes they are called as a popliteal lymph nodes then this is the capsule of the knee joint and this is the popliteus muscle and the fascia over it now what is this oblique popliteal ligament it is an expansion from semi membranosus muscle at the level of its insertion it strengthens the knee joint capsule the fibers which are arising from the oblique popliteal ligament they pass upwards and laterally and they extend from the posterior aspect of medial tibial condyle to the lateral aspect of the intercondylar line of the femur so this is the oblique popliteal ligament so this ligament is pierced by some structures which are present around here they are the middle genicular vessels which is branch of popliteal artery and middle genicular nerve which is a branch of the tibial nerve also genicular branches of the posterior division of obturator nerve also pierces the oblique popliteal ligament now the roof the roof you can see this picture this is the outline of the popliteal fossa we have some structures in the roof so the roof is more superficial structure when you see from behind 
or it's more posterior where you see from anterior aspect okay so the roof is formed by the skin which is a more superficial structure then the superficial fascia the deep fascia so these are the structures which form the roof and in the roof we have about four structures present here so there are three cutaneous nerves they pierce the roof and one vein we have one vein which is piercing the roof so these are the three cutaneous nerves now let us see what are the nerves you see this is the posterior cutaneous nerve of thigh number one number two this is the posterior division of the medial cutaneous nerve of thigh number three this is the peroneal or sural communicating nerve this is the small saphenous vein so these are the four structures that pierce the roof of the popliteal fossa now let us briefly describe these contents the posterior cutaneous nerve of thigh has got the root value of s1 s2 and s3 this nerve passes vertically downwards almost in the middle of the thigh and it is found just underneath the deep fascia but is superficial to the long head of the biceps femoris it pierces the roof of the popliteal fossa and becomes cutaneous and finally supplies the upper part of the posterior aspect of the leg now this is the medial cutaneous nerve of thigh the root value is l2 l3 it is from the femoral nerve the anterior division of the femoral nerve in front in the front of the thigh it divides into anterior and posterior division actually the posterior division of the medial cutaneous nerve of thigh this is the posterior division of the medial cutaneous nerve of thigh that is the one which appears in the roof of the popliteal fossa it supplies the skin on the medial side of the lower ter two thirds of the thigh the peroneal or sural communicating nerve this is the peroneal or sural communicating nerve which you see here now from above if you trace this is the sciatic nerve this is the tibial nerve this is the common peroneal nerve the tibial nerve gives rise to a cutaneous nerve that is called as the medial sural cutaneous nerve then from here from the common peroneal nerve we have the lateral sural cutaneous nerve and it gives off a small cutaneous lateral cutaneous nerve of the calf and then continues as the sural communicating nerve which joins with the sural nerve above the heel it supplies the skin of the lateral area of the calf the small saphenous vein begins as a continuation of the lateral end of the dorsal venous arch supplemented by the lateral marginal vein of the foot so here we have a arch this is called as the dorsal venous arch from the lateral end another vein the lateral marginal vein of the foot it, all, it joins the lateral end together they form the small saphenous vein or the short saphenous vein they both run below and behind the lateral malleolus then they ascend lateral to the tendocalcaneus and here it is accompanied by the sural nerve on the lateral side reaches the popliteal fossa lies in the roof of the fossa then pierces the deep fascia and opens into the popliteal vein now this picture you can see this is the popliteal vein and this is the small saphenous vein which goes and opens into the popliteal vein now so far we have discussed the different aspects of popliteal fossa we first studied the location of the popliteal fossa that is behind the knee joint the definition it is a rhomboid shaped depression situated behind the lower end of the femur posterior aspect of thigh upper end of the tibia then we discussed the different boundaries the superior medial superior lateral inferior medial inferior lateral and the roof and the floor now we move on to the contents of the popliteal fossa now this picture 
shows you the different contents that is the different structures present in the popliteal fossa. We have the tibial nerve, common peroneal nerve. The sciatic nerve we already discussed at the superior angle of the popliteal fossa it divides into its terminal branches that is the tibial nerve and the common peroneal nerve. Then we have a vein that is the popliteal vein and the tributaries of the popliteal vein. Then the small saphenous vein which is opening into the popliteal vein. Then the popliteal artery and its branches. So these are the different contents of the popliteal fossa. Apart from these main structures, we have few more structures. The posterior cutaneous nerve of thigh in the roof, which we already studied, then the genicular branches of the obturator nerve, popliteal lymph nodes, and a pad of fat. So these are the additional structures which are present in the popliteal fossa. Now it is very important to understand the relative position of the contents which are present in the popliteal fossa. The popliteal artery, popliteal vein and tibial nerve travels across the fossa vertically. So this is, you just see this picture here, this is the, let us take this as the outline of the popliteal fossa. Now you see the popliteal artery, popliteal vein and tibial nerve are traveling across the fossa vertically and they are arranged one over the other. The popliteal artery is the deepest. Now you can see this is the, they are running across the fossa vertically. This is the popliteal artery which is the deepest. Then the popliteal vein is in the middle. You can see this one as, you can take this as a popliteal vein and the tibial nerve is lying in the more superficial plane. And the common peroneal nerve is crossing the fossa obliquely, it is crossing the fossa obliquely from the superior angle to the lateral ang angle along the medial border of the biceps femoris muscle. So the relative positions of the contents are very important because any surgical operative procedures done in this area, you should be clearly aware of the position of these structures. And also the mediolateral plane relations, that is also important. Now if you look at this picture, we can see the relative position of the contents in a mediolateral plane. So this is the medial side, this is the lateral side. So the now I will just describe the contents, this is the common peroneal nerve. This is the tibial nerve, this is the popliteal artery, this is the popliteal vein. You can see the artery is lying deepest, then we have the vein, then we have the tibial nerve and the common peroneal nerve is running along the superior lateral aspect. Now if you see the structures in the upper part of the fossa, middle part of the fossa and in the lower part of the fossa, their, their relations are varying. In the upper part of the fossa, medial to lateral, we have the artery, popliteal artery, popliteal vein and the nerve, tibial nerve. So in the upper part of the fossa, the contents are arranged from medial to lateral. The most medial structure is the artery, then the vein and then the nerve. In the central part, the middle part of the fossa, we can see from behind forwards this arrangement. Nerve vein artery and in the lower part again the arrangement is from medial to lateral most medial is the nerve in the middle we have the vein and in the lateral aspect we have the artery. So this relative position of the contents in the mediolateral plane is also important. Now we will move on to the description of the contents, we will just briefly discuss about the each of the contents. First let us discuss the popliteal artery. The popliteal artery 
is continuation of the femoral artery. So, this is the femoral artery. It continues as the popliteal artery. It commences at the hiatus magnus at the junction of middle third and lower third of the thigh. It runs downwards and laterally reaches the lower border of the popliteus muscle. This is the popliteus muscle. It reaches the lower border then divides into anterior and posterior tibial arteries. The adductor magnus muscle presents a small opening in the lower aspect and that is called as the hiatus magnus. It is through this opening the femoral artery enters the posterior aspect of the thigh and then continues as the popliteal artery in the popliteal fossa. Now, what are the relations of the popliteal artery? Now, let us first see the anterior relations of the popliteal artery. Now, if you trace above downwards, so these are the structures. Popliteal surface of femur, back of the knee joint and the fascia covering the popliteus muscle. So, these three structures are related anteriorly above downwards. So, above popliteal surface of femur, then back of the knee joint and lower down fascia covering the popliteus muscle. This if you remember, this is the, all these structures are the floor structures of the popliteal fossa. So, if you know the floor, then you can easily discuss the anterior relations of the popliteal artery. Posteriorly, we have the popliteal vein and tibial nerve. The popliteal vein and tibial nerve, they both cross the artery from lateral to medial side. Now, you can see this picture. This is the nerve, this is the vein. These two structures are crossing the artery from lateral to medial as they course downwards. Now, again just to recap the floor, these are the different structures of the floor. The fat over the popliteal surface of femur, the capsule of the knee joint, popliteus muscle and the fascia covering it. So, these are actually the anterior relations of the popliteal artery. Uh, now, let us see the medial and lateral relations of the popliteal artery. Now, this is the popliteal artery, this is the popliteal vein and this is the tibial nerve. On the lateral side, we have the biceps femoris muscle, tibial nerve and popliteal vein in the upper part. Plantaris muscle, which is not seen in this picture, but actually it will appear here. Plantaris and the lateral head of the gastronomius are related in the lower part. On the medial side, we see the muscle, semimembranosus in the upper part. You can see the semimembranosus in the upper part. Then we can see the tibial nerve, popliteal vein and the medial head of the gastronomius in the lower part. So, these are the medial relations of the popliteal artery. Now, let us see the branches of the popliteal artery. So, this is the popliteal artery. It gives rise to three important branches, the muscular branches, cutaneous branches and genicular branches which supply the knee joint. The muscular branches are the upper muscular branch and lower muscular branch. The upper muscular branch gives branches to the hamstrings and adductor magnus muscle. The lower muscular branch gives branches to the gastronomius, soleus and plantaris muscle. The cutaneous branches, they arise directly from the artery or from the muscular branches and the genicular branches which supply the joint, they are five branches, two superior, two inferior and one in the middle. Now, you can see this picture, this is the superior medial genicular artery or superior medial genicular artery. This is the superior lateral genicular artery. This is the inferior medial genicular artery. This is the inferior lateral genicular artery and here you can see the middle genicular artery. 
the middle genicular artery pierces the oblique popliteal ligament. The next content, the popliteal vein. Veins accompanying the anterior and posterior tibial arteries lower down, they join to form the popliteal vein at the lower border of the popliteus muscle. Then it continues as the femoral vein at the hiatus magnus. The popliteal artery enters the back of the thigh through the hiatus magnus. The popliteal vein leaves the back and enters into the anterior aspect, continues as the femoral vein through the same hiatus magnus. Then here the relation with the popliteal artery, in the upper part it is lying posterolateral to the artery. In the middle part it is posterior to the <coughs> artery and in the lower part it is medial to the artery. So this is artery here in the lower part, this is the vein. So this the relation with the artery varies in the upper, middle and lower part. The next content is the tibial nerve. This is the tibial nerve. The root value of tibial nerve is L4, L5, S1, S2 and S3. It is one of the larger terminal branches of the sciatic nerve. It extends from the superior angle of the fossa to the inferior angle of the fossa. It crosses the popliteal vessels from lateral to medial side. So, this is the lateral side, this is the medial side. Popliteal vein is here, popliteal artery is here. The tibial nerve is crossing as it courses along the popliteal fossa. It crosses the popliteal vessels from the lateral to the medial side. And it lies posterior to the popliteal vein and artery. Here you can see the relation. Now, what are the branches? It has genicular branches, cutaneous branch, a muscular branch and terminal branches. The genicular branches, they arise in the upper part of the fossa. So, these are the genicular branches, superior, medial, genicular, middle, genicular nerve and inferior, medial, genicular. Of this, the middle genicular nerve pierces the posterior capsule and supplies structures in the intercondylar notch of the femur. The cutaneous nerve of the tibial nerve is called as the medial sural cutaneous nerve. It originates in the middle of the fossa, leaves the fossa at the inferior angle, joins the lateral sural cutaneous nerve and forms the sural nerve. The area of supply, it supplies skin of lower half of the back of the leg lateral border of the foot till the tip of the little toe. The muscular branches, they arise in the distal part of the fossa. They supply the gastronomius, soleus, plantaris and popliteus. And the terminal branches, which are not concerned with the popliteal fossa of the medial and lateral plantar nerves. Now, this picture just to show the distribution of the tibial nerve. So, this is the tibial nerve. You can see the genicular branches here. These are the muscular branches. You can see most of the muscular branches are arising from the lateral side except the branch to the medial head of the gastronomius which is arising on the medial side. The nerve to popliteus is a little interesting nerve. I will just briefly discuss the nerve to popliteus. The nerve to the popliteus crosses the popliteal artery it winds round the lower border of the popliteus, then supplies the muscle from its anterior surface. So, actually it is running on the posterior aspect of the popliteus, then goes to the distal aspect of the popliteus muscle, winds round its lower border and then comes to its anterior surface and supplies the uh, muscle. So, that is the interesting part there. And apart from that, it also supplies the tibialis posterior and the tibiofibular joints. The medial side of the nerve is the safe side to operate. This is because all the muscular branches, namely to the lateral head of gastronomius, soleus and plantaris, they all arise from the lateral aspect. 
only one muscular branch that is the branch the medial head of gastrocnemius is arising from the medial side. Now the next content the common peroneal nerve. The root value of common peroneal nerve is L4, L5, S1 and S2. It is the smaller terminal branch of the sciatic nerve. It extends from the superior angle of the popliteal fossa. Then it passes to the lateral angle along the medial border of biceps. Here the, on the lateral side we will have the biceps femoris muscle. So, it runs along the medial border of the biceps femoris muscle. Then it winds around the neck of the fibula. Then pierces peroneus longus muscle and divides into superficial and deep peroneal nerves. Now, let us see the branches of the common peroneal nerve. So, this nerve also gives rise to genicular branches, cutaneous branch and usually there would not be any muscular branch. If at all there is a muscular branch arising out of common peroneal nerve, it might supply the biceps shorthand. Now, what are the genicular branches? They are all on the lateral side, the superior lateral genicular nerve, inferior lateral genicular nerve, recurrent genicular nerve. The cutaneous nerves, the lateral sural cutaneous nerve of the cough, it joins the medial sural cutaneous nerve to form the sural nerve and the peroneal communicating nerve also arises from this and that communicates with the sural nerve. Now, we are coming to the last part of the lecture, the applied aspects, the clinical anatomy. Foot drop, we began with the case scenario of uh, injury to the posterior lateral aspect of the left knee joint. So, that was a case of foot drop. So, here you can see uh, the picture of a foot drop, the patient may, may not be able to dorsiflex and evert. The common peroneal nerve is an important content of the popliteal fossa. It can get injured by an injury on the posterolateral aspect of the neck of fibula. It is two terminal branches that is the superficial and deep peroneal nerves. They both get damaged and in this condition aversion and dorsiflexion of the foot is lost. Blood pressure is usually recorded in the upper limb. Some cases a lower limb blood pressure recording is also needed. So, blood pressure in the lower limb is recorded from the popliteal artery and which is also a content of the popliteal fossa. In coarctation of iota, in a clinical condition called coarctation of iota, the popliteal pressure is lower than the brachial pressure. So, what is this coarctation of iota? It is also called iotic narrowing. It is a congenital condition where the iota is narrow usually in the area where the ductus arteriosus is attached. So, this condition will be associated with difficulty in breathing, poor appetite, failure to thrive and sometimes the condition, the narrowing is very severe. There will be a arterial hypertension in the arms whereas, a low blood pressure in the lower limbs. You can see the popliteal artery is very much bulged like this. So, this is called as the popliteal artery aneurysm. Aneurysm is the enlargement of any artery which is caused because of weakness of the vessel wall. So, popliteal artery aneurysm presents as a pulsatile swelling in the popliteal fossa. Usually, it is asymptomatic, but sometimes the rupture may cause bleeding and that leads to shock. Tibial nerve can be injured. Damage to tibial nerve causes motor and sensory loss. The motor loss results in paralysis of muscles of cough and intrinsic muscles of the sole. A sensory loss results in loss of sensation in the sole of the foot, plantar aspect of digits and the dorsal nail beds. The lymph nodes which we saw in the popliteal fossa as they can be enlarged that is called as the popliteal lymphadenopathy. There are about 6 to 7 small lymph nodes present in the popliteal fossa. 
the popliteal lymph nodes they are lying along the course of the short saphenous vein they get enlarged in infections on the lateral side of the foot because that is the drainage area of this popliteal lymph nodes the popliteal artery entrapment syndrome is symptomatic compression or occlusion of the popliteal artery due to a developmentally abnormal positioning of the popliteal artery in relation to the medial head of gastrocnemius it is associated with intermittent claudication so claudication refers to pain discomfort numbness in legs during walking and thrombus formation associated this popliteal artery entrapment syndrome is associated with intermittent claudication and thrombus formation sometimes this thrombus can get dislodged and travel as an embolus popliteal artery narrowing or occlusion constant pulsation of the popliteal artery against the unyielding tendon of the adductor magnus muscle results in pathological changes in the vessel wall this leads to narrowing and occlusion of the artery sudden occlusion may cause loss of blood supply below the knee leading to gangrene baker's cyst or usually sometimes it is called as popliteal cyst now this is the knee joint what is this baker's cyst it is a fluid filled cyst causing a bulge in the popliteal fossa it usually occurs due to arthritis or a cartilage tear this condition is associated with pain in the knee and difficulty in flexing the knee joint in summary what did we learn today we just started off with a case scenario of foot drop then we had a brief interaction on the back of the thigh muscles of the back of the hamstrings then the calf muscles then we discussed the boundaries of the popliteal fossa the contents of the popliteal fossa description of the contents and finally we discussed the clinical anatomy and that brings us to the end of the topic thank you